Chris Collins, whose little video you've just seen, and the video itself um, tells us a little bit about the book. So, Morris, um, tell us a little bit before we go any further about the book itself. It's called it's called Minding Our Own Business. Um, whose business are we talking about? Well, can I just explain? It is minding your own business, but there is a key sentence that follows that, which is, why don't you mind yours? Yes. So in essence, the whole concept of the book is that there are 25 businesses, all that have been reasonably successful, but mainly niche businesses, which have been successful and want to pass on to the younger generation some of their ideas. Some of the things that made them successful ideas that they had generated maybe for new businesses and also to some degree give business trips to younger people if possible. It actually stemmed from an organization which um, a friend of mine, my closest friend, uh, Ellis Elias, who should be on here somewhere, uh, put together because we started an organization called Prime Thinkers about 10 or 11 years ago where we mentored new businesses. There was we used to have 10 people at a session. You had a problem, you would, a business problem, you would tell the business problem, and we would try to come up with ideas how to uh, solve that issue or that problem, or even give them new ideas for businesses. And we did that in aid of Kith and Kids, a charity, which in fact I was uh, a co founder of 51 years ago. So it goes way back. So all the money that went from prime thinkers went to Kith and Kids, and now the money that's going from this book, and by the way, we've already raised 13,500 for Kith and Kids on the sale of the book, so it's going really well. Um, so it has a whole, it, it benefits charity, it gives us, the older generation, an opportunity to put back in society some of the ideas we had, and it helps the younger generation in trying to stimulate their interest, and in fact, to assist them develop their own businesses. I noticed that the, the 25 case studies, including yourself, are, um, shall we say, of mature age without being ageist about it. Um, so what, what, what elements are common, do you think, to the success stories of these 25 people? And, and to the extent that they are, are successful, what lessons are there for younger business people? Well, first of all, just to explain the first thing, the whole idea we, we, that everybody in it's over 60. So there was a baseline for that. Um, I, I think one of the reasons is we didn't want to get too much into new technology, which most of us would fail desperately at. No, so, <laughs> yeah, so, so we, we're clever, we're no mugs. So we put it together for the over 60s. Now, what's in common, a very difficult thing to really say, I mean, other than the fact of the age, which is one issue, most of them, I, I, in fact, I'm thinking about out of the 25, there are probably only three or four that ever went to university. Most of us started our own businesses when we were younger or came out of a trade. In my own, in my own instance, I was a printer and I started my own printing business. And that was the beginning of my, my um, uh, development. I went into other businesses but I learned the business trade as somebody that was developing my own skill, which I did when I was an apprentice, right? I was, uh, as a matter of interest, if, if I could move on to that, is that when I was, um, like most of us in the war, I was evacuated as a kid, came back, went to grammar school. I was a total idiot, the total dunce at school. Um, they didn't know what to do with me, although it was a grammar school, Palmeters, if there's any Palmeterians here. Uh, I, I went to grammar school, I, I left grammar school and went to the Jewish Board of Guardians at the time. And um, I said, I need a job. And they suggested two. One was a jeweler and one was a printer. And I was sent up to Muswell Hill to a little shop uh, in Muswell Hill, where there were two ex-army guys starting their own business. And I stayed with these two guys for six years. Um, one of them, one of them uh, sadly has uh, died. In fact, both of them have died now. They were called Shackman and Silver. I only say that in case anybody know, remembers Bob Shackman or Dave Silver. They were great guys and I was totally 
devoted to them. And I learned my trade. Um, it got to a stage where, in the fact, I was running the business uh, while they were off swanning on the golf course. But that was a, another situation. I went to printing school one day a week um, where I, my only knowledge, the only thing I remember was that I stood in one of the mock elections as the communist candidate and got in. Um, and many, many years later, when I was looking for work, uh, I went to Lloyd's Insurance Printing Works. They were passing out work and I knocked on the door and the guy that opened the door looked to me and said, Mori the commie. That was the only back thing I got from actually uh, being at the printing school. So to go back to my question, which was, uh, you've done, you've What's done a lot of ignoring it, um, which was, do these 25 people who, I mean, they're all, the one thing they have in common is that they're successful. Um, not so totally. Do, not totally, but mainly successful, but I mean, what? Uh, is, is 99%. It, is it is it just a spark of ingenuity or is it is it is it having a good idea or is it marketing it? I mean, what is it that it's the it trouble? The trouble is it's a combination of all those things. I don't think you can isolate one thing. Some people inherited the business, others started out just as a hobby. I, I noticed that Sylvia is here, Sylvia Young is on, on this lot, who's one of our prime people who's who started out from a very, very working class background just uh, had kids locally to learn theatre skills and now has the biggest the most famous school in Britain and uh, and she's on on here somewhere interestingly enough the only person that's with her again which is a totally different scene is her sister who had a hobby in banknotes right it was just a hobby and it developed into a massive business it was just a thing that she did on her own so there are people that I, that I, I have to say I can't find one particular aspect that would make everybody in common. They are all different and arrived at their successful business in a variety of routes. Can I, I mean, some of these stories are quite fascinating. I, I'm, I'm curious about the burglar, the burglar who becomes, uh, who becomes <laughs> a successful businessman. T tell us a story about the burglar. Okay, well, I, I, we're, we're all over 18, I assume. Well over. Well over 18, okay. Well, uh, his name was Paul Rimmer, and I met him when I was a printer. Now, he was in, well, let's, have, I'll tell you the story as it goes. You will forgive me, it's slightly saucy, okay? So if you want to cut me out, do so. He was a, a professional burglar. Professional in the sense that he would never burgle a house, only businesses. Not quite sure how that makes it any better, but this is what he claimed. Was inside Nick for three times, inside prison. And on the third time, he realized that if he did it again, he was going to serve a long, long session in the Nick. And he was sitting watching um, with some other guys, discussing what their future holds. And he was outside of the, um, he was outside of the shower room. And he noticed that, Gentlemen who weren't that well endowed would be wearing a towel around themselves, and the ones that were would not wear a towel. And one of the guys he was sitting with said, well, if there was a way of making it bigger, I could make a fortune. Right? Are you okay still? Everybody yeah. left the scene? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when he actually left Nick, he decided to embark upon that situation and not go into it too closely. He did develop something and he sold that something and then went into something called marital aids, which I think all of you know about. He was the first person to bring marital aids into Britain. Um, he had his own uh, shop where he had a psychologist and anybody who had issues or problems within the sex field would come and be able to meet them and discuss their problems with them. Nowadays, of course, it's rife everywhere. But in those days, he was certainly a pioneer in that situation. The most wonderful guy, I have to tell you. And he ended up being an actor. At the age of 75, by the way, his, he, his wife divorced him because he ran off with a younger lady. His wife divorced him, took the business. He then went into acting. And in fact, if, you, if, if anybody reads the book, uh, he, uh, there's lots of pictures of him in the in, in all in the bill and all those programs 
up to the age of 94. He has died about two years ago, actually. An amazing man, an amazing story, an absolutely amazing story, to think that this whole idea, and may I say it was extremely successful, extremely successful. Is, it, is, uh, he, is he the favourite, your favourite story in the book, or do you have a favourite? I don't say, I won't answer that. You won't. <laughs> it's the funniest, it's the funniest. Um, one of the other things I notice about these people, you, you say, by and large, they didn't have business plans, um, which strikes me as a bit odd these days, because in my experience, anybody who, ha who has a business and wants to raise finance to a bank gets kicked out the front door if they don't have a business plan. Now, the business plan might be complete rubbish, and it might be a complete invention, but you do still need to have one. So, so, so how does that fit together with the modern way of creating a business? It's an interesting question. If, in fact, I, I never asked the question of the 24 other people, but certainly myself, I never had a business plan. And I know Ellis, and I'm not sure if Ellis has turned up on here, who's my co-conspirator in the fact that we put the whole thing together. Um, Ellis Elias, he's, he's in the music business. Is he, is he on? Did he turn up? Do you know if Ellis has turned up? Um, he, he was, he's in the music business. He originally was my apprentice as a compositor, right? The day he left me, he left the industry and went into music and has been extremely successful. I'm sure he never had a business plan. I never had a business plan. And I would guess that at least 70% of the people in the book didn't have a business plan. Interesting, Sylvia Young, who I know is here. I mean, one of the quotes uh, that she puts here, I, I, if I could find it quickly, what, I know it, it ends up something like this. She said, I, I went into the bank to borrow eight, uh, eight million pounds and I was referred to the entrepreneurs department. I suppose I must be one. So there's a certain, a certain innocence about all of us, I guess. We did it because we learned our trade, we developed our business, and we didn't. I never borrowed any money. In, in all the years I've been in business, other than in property, I've never borrowed any money to start a business. And I've had three or four. But do you think this approach would still be um, one that people could adopt today successfully? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, only you're suggesting that you need to go and raise money to start a business. I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I think people, people um, start a business, usually it evolves from something they're doing, right? So, I mean, in my case, my, I mean, if we get on to my story, I mean, my business involved that I was apprenticed as a printer, started my own printing company, was reasonably successful, managed to bring up my children on the back of that, um, but it ended up with just a new idea that came out of the blue. Uh, it's interesting what you say about cash and not having to raise any money. Um, in my experience of business, the thing that kills businesses is an absence of cash. It's not necessarily an absence of profit. It's people just, you know, businesses go out of business because they run out of cash. That is true. I mean, as I say, it's horses for courses. I can only, you asked me the question about the 25. Um, I, I don't know how many of them actually borrowed money to develop their business. I don't know that. We, I don't think we answered that question, although we didn't ask the question when we were doing the interviews of the various people. We never, we never went into that type of detail. We were much more interested in the marketing side, how they marketed their business, how they managed to reach their customer, and above all, um, the, the type of advice they could pass on to others. Now, I, I, in my particular one, I did give a lot of advice. I did give a lot of pointers because I, in the end, I ended up in the marketing field. So I thought I had ideas to pass on. But everybody, their very story explains how they did it, what they did, where they came from, which is the essential aspect of it. I mean, all of the stories are interested. I mean, the more niche, the, I mean, for example, we have the guy that opened the museum of brands and packaging, Robert Opie. I don't know if anybody's been to his museum. In my view, it's the best in London, near Portobello Road. Um, uh, Brands and Packaging, a great, great place to go to. I mean, he started up because he was a collector and he's turned his collection into one of the most exciting museums, I think, in London. So it's very difficult for me to answer your question about money. I don't think you need money if you've got a good idea and you've got energy and time. 
At what stage in your life, I mean, we can go back over your life, but what stage in your life did you realise that you were had a, a flair for business? I mean, because obviously, you, you talk about your evacuation and leaving school at 14. Um, I mean, are you the archetypal sort of barrow boy made good? Well, <laughs> I think when we see some photographs in a minute, you'll yeah. see me as a barrow boy. And in fact, I did start uh, at the age of 11 or 12 down, um, down the lane, if people remember it, on the wall. Uh, I used to go around with my mate buying used uh, playing cards which we would buy for sixpence and sell for one and six um, uh, down the market. So I guess I did start down in that market field. Um, remember, I mean, if, if I'm allowed to just explain, when I was apprenticed, at the, when I was finished at the same time as I was apprenticed, I joined an ultra-left Zionist youth movement. And in fact, one of the people on here is somebody called Rami Billis from Mikey Butts. He's, come, he's actually on here at the moment um, and also, in fact, writing his own book, which is quite an exciting one. Now, when I was in the movement and very left wing, at the same time as I was business, of course, I was a socialist. I had no idea of starting my own business. It was a, a very, very far from my thoughts. When, when I got married, my wife and I went on Aliyah. We went to Kibbutz Zikim. And I only started in business when I returned, had my my daughter Kim who as many of you know is severely learning disabled and then I had to earn a living and I started my own business or in fact I went into with my old partner and took over the business and that's how I, I developed. Um, I went from printing into manufacturing box games for the swag trade and I'm swag. sure many of the you, uh, what? Tell us about swag. You don't know what swag is. Well, I do now because you told me, but I don't think anybody else. Does. And you didn't know, did you? No, you didn't. Well, know. I thought it was something on the end of a curtain rail. Yeah, well, there you are. You see, you've got to got to learn that. This is why the difference about getting into business. I was at the bottom end of the market. I used to be called a winkle bag printer. The winkle bags were the lowest of the low in the printing profession, and if you printed winkle bags, you were pretty down down the market, you know. Anyway, um, uh, sorry. Swags. Swag. Uh, I was going, I was looking for business. I went round an exhibition. I came to a stand uh, and he had box games on this stand. And he, uh, I said to the guy, you know, have you got any printing? I was looking for job in work. And he, this guy, rough and ready guy, he's in the, in the book called Paul. He threw me a box uh, of, called a 32-game compendium. And he said, give me a quote, for, in a broad Cockney accent, give me a quote for 20,000 dozen. <laughs> I said, 20,000 dozen? 20,000 dozen. He said, exactly the same. I want that as it is, 20,000 dozen. How much can you do them for? So I rushed, her, rushed back to the office. We worked it out. We worked out a price, uh, which he knocked down by about 50%. Um, and I started manufacturing box games. Now, I was unaware that there were two systems of distribution. One was if you were purchase tax registered and one if you were not purchase tax registered. Now, if you were not purchase tax re uh, um, registered, you would sell your games at source. That was the swag trade. In other words, it was somebody who was unregistered for purchase tax. And there was a whole, if you remember the Houndsditch warehouse, the Houndsditch was the beginning of the swag trade and it started with the peddler trade. So when people would buy their notions, which they would carry around with them, they would buy within the swag, uh, swag trade system. So I began to develop a whole range of box games, which only was distributed through the swag trade. Once I sold them to Tesco's, they canceled the order because they found out that it was being distributed in the swag trade itself. And I ended up with, I don't know, 30 different box games. By the way, I was sued for the first one in the end uh, because we copied exactly the, somebody else's game, exactly. But we developed our own games and it was highly successful. A lot of it was cash, I have to add, carefully. Tell me, if you, if you, you, you alluded a little bit to, to your early days, and, and I think that involved leaving school at 14. Um, 
given your time again, would, would you have rather have had an education? I mean, do, do, do you think that you, you, you know, your business career in any way was affected by the lack of any formal further education? I think, well, the interesting thing is that because I joined the Zionist Youth Movement, I realized what an idiot I was. I mean, I, I have to say, and that came about, I took a girl out. Uh, there's a whole story attached to that, which I think I told once before. I took a girl out at, and I, who had uh, met at a communist party dance. And I realized that I had no conversation. I was a total, total idiot. I and mean, on the tube going back, there was an advert that said the Henry George School of Social Science, free to go, which I joined and I began to get an education. And in the end, I was consuming a book a day. So I, I read and read and read in every aspect of life. Uh, only because I was in this youth room, I became a youth leader and I needed that knowledge. I needed that information. So I, I did learn. I am sorry I didn't go further. I'm sorry that I was such an idiot at school. I really am. But that's how it worked out. So I am sorry, yes. I would rather have had an education. But tell me a little bit more about the, the what going back to what we were talking about earlier, the, the, the principles of a successful business. I mean, these days, I mean, especially in the last 10, 15, 20 years, I mean, so much business has gone online. There's so much internet business. And you know, here we are doing an interview on, on Zoom. Do, do, do you think that the principles that made businesses successful, you know, when you were creating your businesses and when the other people in your book were creating the, their businesses still apply or, or, or do they need to be adapted for them to the modern age? And, and to what extent, if they do need to be adapted, do they need to be adapted? In principle, I think in principle, I think it's the same. It's the means of reaching your customer that has changed. So in, in my, I mean, it didn't take me long to realize that I, if I had a product or I had a service, I needed to reach the customer by whichever means I could. And I think that applies today, but the means are now different. Now you could do it on the internet. For example, even, I mean, I, I was famed for one thing. I was... In my later businesses, I became insert mad. In other words, I, I used inserts till they came out of people's ears with a prepaid response card, right? And, and I used to get all my leads directly from that. Now that still applies today. People still, when they use the word marketing, what they're using is the word sales. So to me, although there is obviously a major difference in terms of the way you communicate, the same principle applies. It's no good putting an ad out on the internet that didn't in the first headline attract the attention of the potential customer. Exactly the same as if I had the printed leaflet. The, the wording, the, the craftsmanships in, in writing one's copy is essential now today if you're on the internet as you were if you were using the printed word on a piece of paper. Exactly the same rules apply. All that's changed is the communication, which is massive. At one point, you I mean, if you think about it, we didn't even have radio advertising in the UK. And, and when did TV advertising start? I was well into my business life before we had the opportunity to uh, advertise on TV. So the whole thing is down to how you communicate to your customer, which I believe is very similar. And in fact, in my particular article, for example, I, as you know, I went into the exhibition business. The whole key to the exhibition business is how you sold off a stand. I could make the difference between somebody having a wasted time at an exhibition and somebody who could have massively successful. But maybe we'll come on to that later. I wanted to ask you about some of the, I know you've got some photographs available that you, you were thinking of, of showing us. I mean, is there anything appropriate that you want to show at, at this well, point? Well, uh, I think if we could see, I, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to, the, this, uh, it's, if we could show the second picture, if that's possible, this is the type of printed work I used to do because I was doing this in chronological order. Right, now th uh, that's quite humorous. In the 1960s, a chap called Martin Goodman um, produced a thousands of different cards that sold from the 1960s. I thought this would give you an, an illustration and a bit of a laugh. 
as it goes along. If we move on to the next slide. Right, that's one of my box skeins, a painting by number set, uh, which we produced. This used to sell two for a pound. And it was a ginormous box and it was called Bags of Wind in the Swag Trade. I'm ashamed to tell you, never had a complaint, mind you. So that gives you an idea of the type of box games. Um, uh, I don't know if you want me to move on to the exhibition side. Um, well, go on, while you're in, yeah, you're in the flow, go for it. <laughs> right, okay. Well, what happened was, so I, I was a printer. Um, I was exhibiting my box games at the Harrogate Toy Fair. And I used to advertise in the Sunday time business to business column uh, to get work for, uh, by the way, when I was a printer, I moved into producing cartons and display boxes. So I, I, I became a little bit in a niche area. I was laying, I was laying, I was sitting on the beach in Mallorca with my two kids. And I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could put the Sunday times business to business page into three dimension, that is to have it um, so that people will be able to come and see the actual uh, companies that are mainly service industries. That's why it's called business to business to come along and do it. So uh, when I got back, I didn't have any introduction. I phoned up the Sunday Times, spoke to the marketing director. I said to him, I've got a, an idea that you might be interested in. He said, fine. Um, why don't you let me take you out for a business lunch? I'd never been on a business lunch before. So off I went out on the business lunch. His name was Peter Deer. We, we sat there talking and I explained to him my idea, which of course is, um, is having this exhibition called Business to Business. And he said to me, well, what do you want? I said, well, you know, what I'd like to do is I would like you to, I would do everything. I will get everything. And you, you will get the kudos of having your name attached to the exhibition. He said, well, are you an exhibition organizer? First lie, sadly, well, yes, I am. Although the only knowledge I had about exhibitions was in fact, the fact that I exhibited the Harrogate Toy Fair. So then he said to me, to my astonishment, he said, um, so how much do you want? All I wanted was the advertising. So I said, oh, 20,000 quid. Now this was in the seventies, remember? Uh, he, he said, uh, okay, so can you give me a written, um, a written idea of what it's all about, which I did. Blow me down, he phones me back. He said, look, I'm at the bottom of the marketing chain in this place. If I don't do something, I'm gonna be sacked. I'll go for it. So I started my first exhibition, it was about 1977. It was called the Sunday Times Business to Business Exhibition. And it was at the Horticultural Halls. Uh, I had just three staff then. It was a riotous success. I had adverts all the time in the Sunday Times, every Sunday Times would be advertising the exhibition. It was a massive success. And I, they then asked me to do another one, which I ended up doing uh, at Earl's Court, which by then I had 800 stands. I had 10 to 12 staff. Um, other people came to me for exhibitions. After a few years, I was running 28 exhibitions all over the UK, some in Europe as well. Um, I had 50 staff, uh, 50 sales staff selling the exhibitions, an amazing success. Can I, can I just, uh, it's, a, it's a great story and I like the idea of you doing it on a beach. Um, <laughs> best ideas always happen on a beach. Um, the, I wanted to bring you back to, the, to really the, where we are currently in, in, in our current economic cycle, which is uh, who knows where we are. Um, but it's, it's clearly the case that there are a lot of businesses now, small businesses who are struggling to survive and only surviving with, their, with the help of, of government handouts. Um, I'm just sort of wondering whether you see that the prospects for small businesses and medium sized businesses over in, really over the next three to six months it's clearly life and death for many of them, but whether you would have any any uh, advice to give to people who are really on the edge at the moment and not knowing whether their businesses have a future? Well, I mean, I, 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 I'm now, as you know, in property. I've got a lot of tenants, some of them retail, some of them are offices. They are all having a terribly tough 
time just existing. They're not youngsters, they're not new businesses. Quite a few of them are in their 50s, some in their 60s. They have nowhere to go. They have to continue in their business just to make a living. So it's not just young people that we have to stimulate. We have to make sure that people who have started their own business do continue. And as I say, I, I am very worried about the people uh, that are, um, are coming to a situation now where the market may not even be there. We're not even sure that it's anybody going to turn up into the high street or to retailers. So I, I am very concerned about it. On the other hand, I do believe there's a massive amount of entrepreneurship out there. In fact, only this morning I was speaking to an Afro-Caribbean lady. She's 35 years old, wants to start her own training business, was interested in one of our units. And I could see, and she, by the way, no education. She did have a plan. I have the business plan, I have to say, which she did. She's starting this whole uh, situation up. She came through, through me through an estate agent, but I realized that she needed a great deal of mentoring. Just as a matter of interest, you know, the, I don't know if you know that the business and IP section of the British Library has a tremendous entrepreneur training scheme. They have over 5,000 people all over the UK who belong to that. So there is a lot of support for young people if they want to start their own business. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure if we all sat around the table now, we could generate 20 ideas, 20 business ideas. All we've got to do is implement them. So you, you mentioned there in passing the high streets. What, what do you think is, is the future of the high street? And what, in fact, is the future of city centres and office blocks? You're, you're touching on a raw nerve there, because <laughs> <laughs> that's my livelihood. Um, well, sadly, a lot of the office blocks are turning into, re into residential, right? Which, in fact, I'm... I'm doing myself to some degree. Um, I do believe there is a place for the high street. I do think it's important. Uh, it is the center. I do think so. I do think it will change. It will become more of a of a social hub beside, besides being just retailers. I mean, I do have faith that the high street will return. Um, one of my properties, uh, for those that uh, perhaps know it, is Font Hill Road, which is probably unique in the UK. It's a road of clothing retailers, ladies clothes retailers. It's just one road by Finsbury Park Station. Anybody want to come when it opens, do come down and find me. Um, it's a, a whole retail road which sells um, dresses, um, wedding dresses, mother of the, prom, mother of the bride, um, uh, things for the kids when they're bridesmaids. But there's no weddings. There's no parties. So you can imagine the state they're in, unless all that returns, and they don't rely, they're not trying to fight the West End, they are all niche market retailers. I, I, I do believe it will come back. If not, Red Cross parcels for me. <laughs> well, well, okay, well, hopefully you won't need a Red Cross parcel. Uh, I'm going to throw it open to questions in a minute, but before I do, I just wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about the, the, the charitable nature of all this. Um, you, you, you mentioned that the proceeds of the book are, are, will go to charity. Tell us a little bit, and the charity is Kith and Kids, is, yeah. is, that, is that correct? Tell correct. us a little bit about, about that charity and, how, and your involvement in it. Right. Well, actually, Kith and Kids uh, is a, a group of parents um, which started uh, 51 years ago, which myself and my wife and my two kids, with um, parents of two partially sighted boys, join together. There is uh, here at the moment, there's Sandra and Ralph that's on here, which is one of their new boys because they started only 40 years ago. So then <laughs> they're new ones. We started the charity Kith and Kids. It's mainly groups of parents who've got together. We, we started out by having lunch together every other Sunday, meeting together every other week to discuss our problems of having children, um, the law as it relates to our kids, um, their social life, everything that went, the schooling they were having. We became a very strong group in terms of, um, of fighting for the rights of people with, with disabilities. And it still exists. We run programs over all the holiday periods and um, it's called Kith and Kids. And in fact, I, I don't know, the book, which is at the back here, which we wrote 
in the 70s tells the story of Kith and Kids and the activities we did. Now, going back to how the book works, Ellis and I, and I don't know if Ellis is here on the thing, um, Ellis and I put together the idea of this book. We funded the totality of the printing of and the editing of the book. So we funded that uh, totally. We then doubled our, our um, contribution by then doubling the price, what it cost us. So the book, as you know, is 25 pound for a book. It cost us about 13 pound 50 that we contributed towards that. And we virtually doubled our money by uh, all the money going directly to Kith and Kids. And that's where we've done our 13,500 so far. And I'm hoping some of the people here would be willing to buy buy one, two, three or four, because they're great. I mean, I can't say they're a good Valentine's Day uh, a book, yeah. but they certainly might, might hit Father's Day. Um, and certainly would is, is for your children who may want to go into business, it's something worth getting. That's the story. I mean, it's it, we've done other fundraising activities before, but this has been enormously successful. We're now thinking of doing another book between 21 and 50. Um, new ideas. Uh, we've got about five or six people already. We're thinking of doing to repeat it for the following year. I, does that explain it? Yeah, you? yeah. Well, I, mean, I think it goes a lot further than that, though, because obviously, I mean, you're being very modest. Uh, you've got an OBE, and I presume your OBE is for, for charitable services. I, I, I guess yes. it is. Um, so uh, you're, you, you, you've been you've been far more widely involved in the in the charitable sector than just that. So can you tell us a little bit about. Uh, about your wider activities? Briefly. Well, I mean, I, I was, I was, um, I was vice chairman of National Men Cap. I was chairman of London Men Cap for about nine years. I was chairman of Harringay Men Cap for twenty-three years. Uh, I, uh, with with others, started um, what is now called Disability Law, which is a free advice service for people with disabilities, children and adults. Um, I've been involved in the disability field. And in fact, I, the one thing I, or besides the OBE, and I got it because I was, an, I was an aggressive father. I think that was what I was quite well known for, that I, you know, I was quite aggressive when it came to my daughters and other uh, youngsters like that. Um, I, um, as I say, I would, I've just been involved. One of the things that I did get, which I was very proud of, because you were talking about my education, I got an honorary MA from the Open University. Now, that to me was really something, because I, ha I had very little education. And to get an honorary MA, and I got it because I, with one or two of the psychologists at the Open University, developed one of the first programs of teaching for uh, nurses and carers in learning disability. And I was the parent input. So, okay. oh, sorry. Go on, no, carry on. No, I was going about to say, um, we've been going for 45 minutes and I've got I, I could, lots of other questions I could ask you, but should we just see if there's anything uh, out there who anybody wants to ask you a question? And if yeah, not, I'll, I'll carry on happily. Can I, can I, can I show the, um, the other slide yeah, go on, uh, of go the on. disability? If, yeah. if, is it around? I just wanted to show the, Okay, that was the Kith and Kids book that came out. If we can move on to about slide four. Okay, uh, okay go back one. Um, just as a matter of interest, I've just got another book out, which is a thousand pages called Marketing History, which is a collection of marketing. Is there one before that? I thought there was one with the box games. Maybe I haven't got it yet. Ah, uh, that's it. Right. This is uh, me as a as a um, as a market trader that's in you. Lambeth Walk that's you. Uh, on the front page of a magazine that's called Mind Your Own Business way back. I don't think if we can see the date there. No, I don't think we can see that. I can't remember it myself. But there it is, pushing my barra down Lambeth Walk, selling my goods, selling the business to business exhibitions. It's May 1981. May 1981. Wow. When I was a young man. <laughs> okay mark I can't, I can't see the audience but are there any is there any are there any questions out there or anything on the chat 
Uh, I've got nothing on the chat at the moment. If anybody wants to put them on the chat, that's always helpful. Uh, if not, if you wave at me wildly or even raise your hand if you know how to do it, uh, or even you can actually unmute yourself while I'm looking for somebody. I've got David Sapphires, I think, ask you a question. Yep, go on then, David, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, this is really fascinating and quite inspiring to hear you, Morris, but um, I think you mentioned your partner, Ellis. Yeah. Uh, and I wondered if I could actually uh, refer either to him or, or to you, or to him through you, um, because if it's the same Ellis who I think wrote Don't Take Your Love to Hollywood a very long time ago, I, I think... Is so that right? I don't know. I'm not sure if he's on or not, but he, he can answer that himself. He is. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the reason I mentioned that Alice, is... You can unmute yourself. Oh, great. Where is he? I, my, my question really relates to the fact that in his case, I believe that a lot of his success came from being a very talented uh, songwriter. And of course, uh, uh, many people will say that... Um, uh, in the music business, as well as many other businesses, what you need is a combination of being, on the one hand, an entrepreneur and a risk taker, in which case you're probably going to be a publisher or a record label, and on the other hand, a dreamer and a creator who knows how to write the song that somebody else will then take the risk with. Um, to what extent have your businesses largely been a combination of whether you needed money or not, as Steve asked, a combination of having, on the one hand, uh, access to the right people, the right ideas, and on the other hand, these simple practical skills of knowing how to monetize an idea. Because nowadays, most businesses seem to be being built to be sold rather than to make a profit. That's a very different economic environment. Well, I wouldn't like to answer for it. Is, is he there? Because he said he would be. I'll kill him if he's not. <laughs> Are you there, me. Eddie? I think you obviously assume he's not. He's not. Oh dear. Well, 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 we, do have, we do have an Ellis on, but he's not choosing to unmute. Come on. Ellis, unmute. He's not shy in coming forward. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I can see John Ball is leaving, by the way, and he was the guy that did that first video. Close friend of mine, photographer. Anyway, have a go at David's question. Well, I, as far I mean, Ellis, I'm not going to tell Ellis his story because it is in the book. He's there. Right? Sorry. He's there. He's there. I am here. Ah, there you are. Go on, Ellis, answer the question. I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. I just popped out for a second. <laughs> what was the question? Shall I, shall I just quickly summarise well, it? Think uh, uh, if, if you are the Ellis who wrote uh, Don't Take Your Love to Hollywood, and I, I hope you are, I think you are. <laughs> is that right? No, I'm not. <laughs> You're not. Oh, in that case, okay. Uh, if you at least were in, I think from what we can see behind you, very much in the music business, it right. just occurred to me that nowadays in the music business, the way to make money is to build a company such as Spotify and whatever in order to sell it. Uh, and if you want to make money in the music business, you have to be either a dreamer who writes or perhaps um, publishes, or you have to be the entrepreneur who decides to take the risk in marketing. The, your intellectual property um, so to what extent frankly in minding your own business nowadays whether it's you or Morris answering the question do you need to have a combination of not necessarily money but talent and access to the right people and frankly both the risk-taking element and the dreaming element well it, it is the, the music business is not a business that you go into because you want to make money it's a, bus it's a way of life Quite. And you have to be passionate about it. Without the passion, you probably won't have success because you won't uh, nurture talent. Um, when other people don't believe in it, you do. Um, so the music business, it's about passion. It's about believing on what you're uh, uh, promoting and creating. You are, and you are a part of that creation with your artist. Um, and a lot of hard work. And in terms of promotion, it's, uh, again, it, it, it's getting to the public. Uh, you get into the public by um, uh, selling records, getting radio plays. In the past, in the, in the early days, which has changed now, you used to go to radio stations as a plugger, 
and get your record played on the radio station, get your artist being interviewed on the radio station. You then used to give give away first 3,000 records to all the record shops who did what they called chart returns. In other words, if they sold the copy, they would send in, I sold one copy, which would go on the, on the chart return, which would make up the charts. So you gave those records away in order that they would then sell them, because they would make 100% profit. Um, it then started later on that people used to give the records away and then send out buyers to go and buy them back again. So it became a very expensive business. Uh, but it is, it, is, it is based on passion. It's based on, um, on, on believing. And, 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 and today it's changed. In the, in the past, you, you made a record and you sold your record and you would sell millions of records. You know, I had a record called In the Summertime, which sold a million copies just in the UK only. Uh, and it went to number one. In the UK now, you'll sell 100,000 copies and go to number one. So in the past, you, you, um, you took your band and you toured them in order to sell records. And now you give away records in order to do tours. So the, the money has changed. The, the, the income has changed. Um, you know, in 1980, we had a band uh, and uh, we toured the whole of Europe. I think we spent about £600,000, which was a lot of money in 1981. And uh, we broke even. But we sold five, six million albums, and that was our profit. You know, whereas today, um, the, the big money is, is in is in touring. And let me the, stop the, you there, Ellis, because yes. we are we're running out of time. I'm just wondering if there are any more questions, Mark. Uh, I'm looking for people waving, and I'm I'm not seeing anybody obvious. But if I'm missing you, please fit. Oh, um, somebody who calls called iPhone, please unmute yourself. Oh, somebody called iPhone. <laughs> Hello. Hello, iPhone. Oh, Suzanne. Hi, <laughs> Suzanne. Hi. Um, I haven't actually got a question to ask. I just wanted to say how enjoyable uh, Morris's talk has been in this whole interview and very, very inspiring. I love hearing his stories. He's helped me a lot with my own business as well. And that's all I really wanted to say that I just think he's amazing. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> If there isn't anything, anybody out there bursting to ask a question, thank you very much, iPhone. Um, 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 I, I wanted to ask Morris something a bit more serious, actually, um, which is obviously with your ex experience and your um, your connections in the with the world of um, disability and and care, um, you know, and and social issues. I'm sort of wondering what you think about the current environment in which it's actually becoming very difficult for people to practice social care um, and social interaction in the way that they used to and I'm thinking particularly about people who are you know uh, in in care homes and people who, who maybe not be able to to meet up with um, their loved ones um, it's clearly a difficult situation and I'm sort of wondering what, what's your take on it Morris well, there's not very much that one can do about it. Of course, for example, I can't visit my daughter who lives in Ravenswood Village, which many of you might know. I can't go down because they're stopping people going down. But putting, putting care into the context of today, it is a major improvement since my daughter, my, my daughter is now 59. She's coming up to 60. She has been within a system that I think is one of the best in Europe. And we always knock social care, but the reality is it really is something very positive in the way that it's organized. For example, the local authority has to assess somebody who has a disability. And when they've assessed that person, if they fall into the criteria of the government, they then have to provide the service that deals with that. So it, it actually works. and and. On the whole, if I compare to today what it was when my daughter was born, there's a vast improvement. And, and I know we always knock government and knock social services. The reality is they do do a good job. This particular situation we're in now is totally difficult. I mean, a different scene entirely. Uh, lucky enough, we have dealt with it, although, of course, a lot of people have died within the nursing home system. Um, but I, I, I have faith. I do have a lot of faith in the social service system and the way 
the democracy in Britain really worked. For example, in Israel, it's far worse. Disability is not cared for to the same legal um, backup as it is in the UK. Um, and in fact, I tried to run a conference there just to try to establish what rights people with learning disability have. And I have to say, it ain't a lot. So, you know, I, I'm fairly confident. I'm, I'm, I think the system's good. I think we're going through a very, very difficult stage, but it will come right. You mentioned that in your particular case, you can't visit your daughter. You can't visit your daughter at all, or, no. or, or there's just restrictions. So, so but nobody's that, allowed. Nobody's allowed in the village, at all, right? Um, uh, but we're hoping that it's going to be lifted shortly. And how do you feel? I mean, obviously, it's not a good situation. But how do you do? You feel that's the right decision in the environment that we're now in. Um, being not a scientist, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. My gut feel is that, first of all, my daughter did get the virus, as it happens, and three or four people in the village have died from the virus, right? Mainly brought in, as some staff have also died from the virus. So the, so the staff has brought it in, and that has made quite a stringent situation in, uh, in, 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 in Norwood with their care. Um, as I say, I'm looking forward to going back to her, just as a matter of interest. Uh, um, we did set up within Kith and Kids and another scheme, which provides for advocates to go down and visit our kids. And in fact, they phone every day to check how our children are. And one or two people on this Zoom are already are part of that. And certainly in Kith and Kids, it's called Class. And if anybody lives near Enfield, we have two shops which funds that whole project. It's called right. Class Shopping in Enfield High Street. Okay, Morris, I, I, I think we are. Um, we have been going for an hour, so I um, and this, I think we, I think we will draw it to a close. I didn't want to end it on a particularly gloomy note because you are clearly a very optimistic character, um, you know, you, and you and you you view the future, I, I guess, as 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 an opportunity rather than a threat. Would that be correct? Yeah, I guess that's pretty accurate. Right. Well, thank you very much, Maurice. I'm glad, I'm glad we had, had a chance to talk to you. Obviously, there's a huge amount we didn't talk about. Uh, I'm interested to know how a communist becomes an entrepreneur and, uh, and manages to put the two things together. But um, well, that's for another, for another day, I think. So uh, let me, on behalf of everybody, uh, say thank you to you. And, and, and I also would uh, now suggest we hand over to, um, to Jane, our, our, our compere, our sponsor. Um, and for her to say a few words. And uh, once again, Morris, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I'm, I'm glad uh, we made it and I'm glad I made it. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now for thank you, I'd like to thank Mark, first of all, our Zoom host, without whom we couldn't do these sessions. Steve, our interviewer. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve, as usual, teasing out things. I know you could go on for ages. There's so much to talk about, but thank you very much. And then Morris, who I think I could say I first met virtually at his last talk when he told us about his incredible, weird and wonderful gadgets. Today, a completely different talk. Fascinating, interesting. It seems to me that the um, way to be very successful is what I can tell is your huge energy and your amazing charisma, which comes over so well at these talks. You're absolutely inspirational. I don't know whether you sleep at all, but you certainly have a life that's uh, incredible. So we look forward to reading your books and I would like to encourage people to both buy Morris's books and also to support Kith and Kids. And if you can't find it on the internet, you can go onto our website. There's just a link where you click and make a donation straight through. And I'm sure Morris would be grateful for any additional funds to his charity, which is clearly extremely worthwhile. So in our usual way, I would like to say thank you to everybody and what we do from our little boxes. Please join me in saying thank you so much, Maurice, for taking the time. <laughs>